This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. If you're watching this program, it probably means that you've recently obeyed the gospel. And we want to congratulate you on making the best decision of your life. That is deciding to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that when you were baptized that you were actually born again. And in a very real sense, you are a new person. You have a new life. Romans 6 and verse 4 says that you were raised to walk in newness of life. Now that being the case, a lot of things are going to be different. Just like a baby born into this world has so much to learn, in a similar sense, you are a babe in Christ. And you need to learn what the Lord wants you to know as a part of His body. Now that's the goal of this particular series, to help cover some of the basic principles, the first principles that you need to know now that you're a child of God. Now before you became a Christian, there was no more important question in all of the world than what must I do to be saved? And we preach a lot about that in the Church of Christ. Because for those who are not yet Christians, there's no more important question. And for those of us who are already Christians, it's good for us too. It helps us in teaching others, and we love to hear it. There's a song that we sometimes sing called, I Love to Tell the Story. And part of that song says, I love to tell the story to those who know it best, seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Certainly preaching, what must I do to be saved, is time well spent. But you know, after I become a Christian, my focus shifts somewhat because no longer am I concerned about what must I do to be saved, to become saved. I'm now concerned with what must I do to stay saved. When I obeyed the gospel and became a Christian, I was saved and the Lord added me to His church, Acts 2.47. But the question now is, how do I stay in that condition? And we need to understand the Bible does teach that there is something required of me even after I'm baptized into Christ if I'm going to go to heaven. Revelation 2.10 says, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now this passage is written to people who were already Christians, but it makes their salvation conditional upon their faithfulness. Sometimes people will say, You people in the Church of Christ think you're the only ones going to heaven. And you know, while it's true that I do have to become a part of Christ's church to go to heaven, you know what? There are a lot of us who are not going to heaven. Now why do I say that? because the Lord said, be faithful, and I will give you a crown of life. And the fact of the matter is, there are many members of the Lord's church who have not continued to be faithful. Many of them have left the Lord. Paul said about the once faithful Demas, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, 2 Timothy 4.10. Now, what we want to do in the next several minutes is, number one, we want to discuss the fact that it is possible to be lost, even after I become a Christian. Number two, we want to discuss the fact that it is also possible to know with confidence that I am saved. And then number three, we want to discuss what's sometimes called God's second law of pardon. Okay, point number one. It is imperative that we understand that it is possible for me to be lost even after I become a Christian. You know, many people in the denominational world don't believe this. They instead hold to a doctrine called once saved, always saved. It's also known as the impossibility of apostasy. And it suggests that a Christian cannot fall from grace. And they will say we're saved by grace and we can't fall from it. And they'll go to passages like John chapter 10 and verse 28 where Jesus said, And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And they'll say, see, once you have salvation, no one can take it from you. And you know, that's true. No one can take it from you. But that doesn't mean that you cannot give it up yourself. The idea of once saved, always saved would be a comforting thought if it were true. But it's not. Now, I want you to observe with me some passages that teach that this doctrine, once saved, always saved, is false. And that rather, salvation is conditional even for a child of God. Now, number one, we've already noticed Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. 
Now, according to this verse, what is required in order to receive the crown of life? And the answer is faithfulness. It is conditional upon my faithfulness to the Lord. Okay, here's another passage. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now, it's interesting to note in this verse that Paul knew that he could leave the faith. Now, verse 8. Finally, he says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Paul was confident that he would receive a crown of life. Why? Because he had kept the faith. You see, it was conditional. Now, here's another, number three. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Peter says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Now, that is to say, you are one of God's children. You are part of the elect, part of the group who is headed for heaven. But this is not unconditional. Now listen as he continues. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, salvation is conditional for the child of God. Now, in addition to these direct passages that teach salvation is conditional for Christians, there are also many examples in the Scriptures that illustrate that salvation is conditional. Now, we mentioned one of these already, a man named Demas. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, the Bible says about him, Demas has forsaken me, that is Paul, having love of this present world. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, that passage illustrates that even the Apostle Paul realized that he could be lost if he did not continue to be faithful. Listen to his words. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, of course, in the race metaphor that he's using, to become disqualified is equivalent to missing heaven. Now, Paul also wrote and told the Christians in Galatia, those who were trying to hold to the law of Moses, he said, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. Now, listen to this. You have fallen from grace. Galatians 5, 4. Now, the language of this verse is very powerful against those who say that you cannot fall from grace because Paul directly stated, you have fallen from grace. And the Apostle Peter uses perhaps the clearest language of any in 2 Peter 2.20 when he writes this about some of the early Christians who had gone astray. He says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now in the next verse, he compares such a Christian to a dog returning to his vomit. He was saved, but he returned once again to the filth of the world. Now that brings us to our second point. Since it is possible for a Christian to be lost, since it is possible for him to let go of the crown of life, can a Christian ever know with certainty that he's saved? You know, some new Christians nearly worry themselves sick over this question. You know, sometimes Christians go from day to day feeling like they can never know, and the best they can ever do is to hope that they'll go to heaven. And sometimes people will say, I hope I've done enough. I hope I'm good enough. I hope I'm going to go to heaven. Dear friend, can I suggest to you, that is not how God intends for His children to live. God doesn't expect His children to go through this life never knowing what eternity holds for them and, and constantly being worried about their salvation. That's a miserable way to live, and it's not the biblical way to live. I want you to consider a passage of Scripture with me. This is one of my favorites, if not my very favorite. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 says this, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. John said that I may know that I have eternal life. And the way that I may know 
is by the things that are written, by the written Word of God. Now, how am I going to know? Well, it's going to involve some self-examination. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. That is, whether you're walking in accordance with the faith, with the Word of God. And I need to do this on a regular basis. And so, as I examine myself, if what I see in my life lines up properly with the Word of God, then I'm living faithfully, and I can have confidence about my salvation. If not, then I need to make some changes. Now, point number three, let's talk about God's second law of pardon. Before I became a Christian, I was lost, and the reason I was lost is because my soul was covered in sin. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Now, sin in my life was going to cause me to lose my soul eternally, and so I needed a remedy for my sin. What can wash away my sins? The song says, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, before you become a Christian, you learned that it is in baptism that you contact the saving blood of Jesus. Matthew 26, 28 says that Jesus' blood is for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38 says that baptism is for the remission of sins. Revelation 1, 5 tells us that the blood of Jesus washes away sin. Acts 22, 16 says that baptism washes away sin. And so, what I needed to do to have my sins cleansed by the blood of Jesus was to be baptized in water. And Romans 6, 4 says that as I came out of the baptistry, I was raised to walk in newness of life. But here's the question. What happens the next time that you sin? You're a Christian now. You're a part of the Lord's church, part of His body. Does this mean that you'll never sin again? And if you do, what do you do about it? you understand that only the blood of Jesus can wash away sin. And so, if I sin after I'm baptized, what then? What if I mess up? Do I need to be baptized again? What do I do then to contact the blood of Jesus? Now, that brings us to what is called God's second law of pardon. The best summation of this principle that I know in the Bible is in 1 John chapter 1. Now, I want to begin reading in verse number 7. The text says this, If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. Now, it's important for us to understand that this verse is written to Christians. If you notice in 1 John 2, 7, you'll see that this book is written to people that John refers to as brethren. They are Christians. And the reason that that is important is because sometimes people in the denominational world will try to apply this passage to alien sinners, to people who have not yet obeyed the gospel, and that's an incorrect use of this passage. This is a passage written to people who are already Christians. Now, I want you to notice something very special in this verse that is written to Christians. He tells me, as a Christian, how to have my sins cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Now, what does he say? Do I have to be baptized again? No. Then what's he say? He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so, what does that mean to walk in the light? Psalm 119 and 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. You see, to walk in the light means to walk in accordance with the Word of God. It means to live a faithful Christian life. And so the promise of 1 John 1, 7 is that if I live a faithful Christian life, I have constant access to the cleansing blood of Jesus. Now, let's keep reading in 1 John 1. Verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You know, it may be that when a person becomes a Christian, he'll think that he's never going to sin again. This verse says such is not the case. You know, sometimes when people become Christians, they seemingly think that God now requires absolute perfection, and that if they fall short in any way, then they are destined for hell. I think God wrote this verse to tell us otherwise. The Lord tells us, even after you become a Christian, 
you will sometimes sin. So what do you do about it? Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If a penitent Christian will confess his sins and ask for forgiveness, the promise is that he will be cleansed of all unrighteousness. And so there are three things involved in God's second law of pardon. Number one is repentance. Number two, confession of that sin to God. And number three, praying for forgiveness. Now, confession of that sin and asking for forgiveness are intimately tied together, and they're the natural result of repentance. Now, we have a beautiful living example of God's second law of pardon in Acts chapter 8. In the city of Samaria, there lived a man named Simon who was a sorcerer. And for years he had fooled the people of that city with his tricks and his magic. Well, in Acts chapter 8, Philip enters into that city and he preaches Christ to all of the people. And Philip did real miracles by the power of God. And so the people began to be baptized, both men and women. But it's also interesting that Simon also obeyed the gospel. He recognized these real miracles that they were from God. Now shortly thereafter, two of the apostles, Peter and John, come to the city and they begin to lay hands on the people so that they might receive the miraculous powers of the Holy Ghost. Now apparently that stirred up an old temptation inside of Simon. And Acts 8.18 says that he offered them, the apostles, money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, here is a man who is now a Christian, Simon, and he has sinned. Now what's he going to do about it? Listen to Peter, verse 22. Peter says, Repent therefore of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Peter tells him to repent, and acknowledging that sin, to ask for forgiveness of it. Now that's God's second law of pardon for Christians. And so, in answer to the question, what must I do to stay saved, John answers this. Number one, walk in the light. Number two, when I do sin, repent, confess, and pray. And if I will do those things, then I will have constant cleansing in the precious blood of Jesus. And I can know that I have eternal life. Now, before we conclude, I want to spend a few minutes discussing further the phrase, walking in the light. What specifically does the Bible mean when it says that I must walk in the light? Well, it's kind of a summary statement that means, do everything the New Testament tells you to do. You know, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The Lord responded, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, that was a short way of saying, obey the law of Moses. It's a summation statement. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, Solomon wrote, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. Again, that's a summation statement. In the New Testament, 2 John verse 9 says, He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. It's a summation statement. And in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, the text we're studying, it says, If we walk in the light, we will be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Now all of these are just summary statements to say, obey the Old Testament or obey the New Testament. But somebody might ask, but is there a specific place that I can go to in the New Testament that lists exactly what it means to walk in the light? And the answer is no. Commandments and principles are found throughout the New Testament. And we could teach on this topic for the next year and maybe not cover all of them. And so what I want to do is to provide you a test to help you to examine yourself, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and to see if you are walking in the light. All right, question number one. I want you to ask yourself this question. Have I been keeping the first and the greatest commandment? 
Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Now this commandment really encompasses all the others. And if you can answer yes to this question, then you're going to go to heaven. Because John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, let's be a little more specific. Let's break this down. Is the Lord first in every list of my priorities? If I'm talking about loving the Lord with all of my heart, mind, strength, and soul, is He first in my every list of priorities? Now, let's be more specific. What about my money? Does the Lord and the church get first consideration when it comes to my money? What about my time? Does the Lord and His kingdom come first when it comes to the division of my time? Or is it something else? Maybe my work or school or recreation or some other activity. What about my personal devotion? Where does it lie? What's at the top of my list? Is it God? Maybe it's my children. Maybe my spouse. Maybe my girlfriend. Do I love the Lord with all of my heart, mind, strength, and soul? All right, here's a second question for self-examination. Am I walking in the light? Question number two, have I been keeping the second greatest commandment? Now again, Matthew 22, after giving the first and the greatest commandment, Jesus then said in verse 39, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think sometimes we maybe put little importance in this area, but the Lord listed it as the second greatest commandment, love for others. You know, James 1 and verse 27 defines pure and undefiled religion. Largely is having to do with care for others. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. In the judgment scene in Matthew 25, why were those on the right hand saved? Among other things, the Lord said in Matthew 25, 34, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. You know, one of the things that we will stand in judgment for on the last great day is going to be our treatment of our fellow man. In John 13, Jesus got up from the table and He girded Himself and He washed His disciples' feet. And He said this, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do also as I have done to you. Now, Jesus did not here bind the practice of foot washing, but what He did do is He bound service toward our fellow man. Service is the key to exaltation in the eyes of God. All right, let's ask a third question. We're talking about what does it mean to walk in the light? Question number three, ask yourself, have I been seeking to teach others? The most important concern that I can show for my fellow man is to be concerned about his eternal destiny. You know, the Lord said when he came to this earth that his mission was to seek and to save the lost, Luke 19.10. And as the body of Christ, our mission should be the same. Now, what is our mission? Matthew 28.19, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And if I'm not actively doing that, if I'm not actively seeking to teach others the gospel, then I can't say that I love the Lord. And I can't really say I love my fellow man, and I'm not going to go to heaven. I can't disregard the two greatest commandments and think that I'm going to go to heaven anyway. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be always ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. All right, question number four. We're talking about what does it mean to walk in the light. We're doing some self-examination here. Question number four, ask yourself, am I growing as a Christian? I can't go to heaven if I'm not growing as a Christian. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And this is not an optional thing. You know, sometimes people treat it like it is. 
Now, the Lord does not expect us to be fully mature overnight. He doesn't expect us to know everything overnight. You know, nobody does that. Christianity is a life process. It's a journey. There are virtues and there are godly characteristics that we seek to develop in ourselves, and it takes a long time. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 5 says, "...giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue." and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. The list is long of the virtues and the characteristics that Christians are to be striving to develop in their lives. The point is, I can't do it overnight, but I do have to be growing and working at it, and praying and asking for forgiveness when I fall short. And a major part of the growth process is study. 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. All right, question number five. Ask yourself this. Have I been worshiping in spirit and in truth, and not forsaking the assembly of God's people? You see, a faithful Christian life is a worshiping life. John 4, 23 says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Now, there are five acts of worship in which every child of God should be engaged on a weekly basis. They are singing, Ephesians 5, 19. Prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Preaching, Acts 20 and verse 7. The Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and following. And giving as I've prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. And all of these acts should be carried out exactly the way they're prescribed in the New Testament. And not only these, but there's also personal devotion. Do you pray at home? Do you pray without ceasing? Do you spend time meditating on the Word of God. Think about your worship. Think about your personal devotion. These are things that a child of God should regularly be engaged in. Okay, question number six. Ask yourself this. Do you keep yourself free from sin? You know, not only are there a number of positives, that is, things that we must do to remain faithful, there are also some negatives, things that we must not do if we're going to remain faithful to God. 1 John 3 and verse 9 says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Now ask yourself, do I diligently resist temptations to sin? You know, there are some Christians who don't. There are some Christians who engage in sin openly and knowingly and regularly. I have known some Christians who lie. I have known some Christians who steal. I've known some Christians who view pornography. I've known some Christians who drink alcoholic beverages. I have known some Christians who choose not to come to worship God. But you know what? They can't go to heaven like that. Paul asked the question, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Romans 6, 1 and 2. Now, that doesn't mean that as a Christian I will never sin. Again, 1 John 1 and 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's not that we never sin, but rather that's not my lifestyle. Sure, I'm going to transgress God's law sometimes, but I don't do it regularly and knowingly and live that way. Now, someone might ask the question, which sins? Tell me what these sins are so that I'll know what to avoid. I wish that I could give you a list of four or five things and say, don't do these four things and you'll be fine. Don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, and you'll go to heaven. But you know, it's not that simple. We no doubt could list hundreds of sins. The New Testament contains a number of different lists of sins. A few of those are Galatians 5, 19 and 20, the works of the flesh, Romans 1, 29 through 31, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and all of these lists are different. Now, there's some overlapping and there's some repetition, but the lists are all different. And we should understand that many of the verses in the New Testament that talk about sins sometimes list terms that are broad in their meaning. Sometimes they refer to categories of sins rather than specific sins. Now, I want you to consider some of these with me. Consider the term fornication. 
Fornication is a term that is a broad term for sexual sin. It includes things such as adultery and homosexuality and bestiality. And so to understand more fully what things are sinful, we need to study terms like these and we need to learn the meanings of these words. What must I do to stay saved? Friends, it's a life process. It involves putting God first, loving my fellow man, teaching the gospel, growing in the word and godly characteristics, worshiping my God, and keeping myself free from sin. And the Bible describes this lifestyle as walking in the light. John says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If I'm living this way and praying for forgiveness when I fall, I'm going to go to heaven. And I don't have to wonder, I don't have to doubt. It is the promise to the faithful.